美国当选总统拜登即将宣誓就任第四十六任美国总统。在美中关系备受关注的科技、贸易、人权等领域，拜登将用什么样的态度和方式来应对中国？我最近采访了卡内基国际和平基金会专家包道格、战略与国际研究中心亚洲高级顾问葛莱仪、著名保守派专栏作家张家敦，以及斯坦福大学研究员梅慧琳这四位美国的资深美中关系专家，请他们。来为我们做个预测。Well, I'm a very strong supporter of President-elect Biden, but I have to admit that I am a little bit worried. Now, I don't like this idea of tough or soft because this suggests you have a policy no matter what Beijing does. The United States needs to be clear that we welcome. A productive, peaceful China into the international community. It's only when Beijing acts irresponsibly and aggressively that we want to be tough against China. So I don't think it's useful to say we're either tough or soft.、Uh, but I am、uh, concerned that maybe President Biden won't push back on Beijing enough and and won't rely on all the tools at his disposal to do so. I think it's good he plans to lead by diplomacy. I think it's good that he plans on building、uh, economic relationships and strengthen our alliances and partnerships. But all of this can be done with a firm foundation of military power. And I'm concerned that he might be more reluctant than President Trump、uh, to leverage that foundation to to continue to deter and shape Chinese behavior. I'm worried for a number of reasons that、uh, President Biden is not going to be adopting appropriate policies. First of all, he's going to give China a grace period. We know that because every president gives China a grace period. President Trump gave the Chinese 14 months of grace period,、um, but right now, what's different between now and 2017, the first year of the Trump administration, is that now we don't have a moment to lose. Also, we have heard、uh, Biden on the campaign, even before the campaign, express opinions which I think are outdated, which view China as.、Um, This this、uh, country that that needs our help,、uh, that's not competition for us,、um, that's not a threat to the United States or to the world. I think those views are wrong. So、um, he comes with an outlook which I think is certainly outdated, and which recent events have proven to be、um, misguided. I don't think that's correct at all. I, I mean, it's it's something that's been put about by people in the campaign to try to discredit uh, Biden. Uh, I think he will be less. Internally counterproductive.、Uh, we don't need to、uh, elevate our relationship with Taiwan to an official kind of relationship the way it has been going, has been developing in the end of the Trump administration. Because the costs of doing that are are great for the people of Taiwan. They they could cost Taiwan ultimately its autonomy. If we're going to be tough on issues like that, we better get ourselves back to the gym. In the U.S. and build our our bodies up and trim our trim our muscles so that we can handle China better when we get into confrontations.、Uh, I think Biden has the promise of a more a step by step approach on these issues, but you know, he has to deal with conflicting coalitions in his own party.、Uh, he's been strengthened by the Georgia election, giving the Senate、uh, a majority, probably、uh, with the vice president.、Uh, For the Democrats, that means is he will encounter less obstruction.、Uh, I think Biden has got a capacity to reach across the aisle to the Republicans, and he's more of a compromiser、uh, than we've had in recent years. And I think that's a good thing. But whether that will make him strong, whether he can hang in there under adverse circumstances, it's still to be tested. I am not worried about、uh, about President.、Uh... Biden, when he is inaugurated, and、uh, and his administration、uh, being soft on China. First, I think that many of these people experienced what was China's real turn towards more assertive,、uh, and in some cases bellicose behavior、uh, in the in the late, latter years of the、uh, of the Obama administration,、uh, and they have lived through some promises being made by China that then were not kept. So they have that experience. Uh, and I think that they are going into this administration with eyes wide open.、Uh, I think that Biden will set clear priorities. He will develop、uh, effective strategies to achieve them. And、uh, I personally don't view engaging 
in well-crafted dialogue with China or cooperation with China as soft. So I think that some people do, but I don't share that view. Well, I think it goes without saying that the Biden administration will do a review uh, when it comes into office. Uh, they will examine the pre-existing uh, policies, uh, the, and, and there have been many new policies that have been implemented, uh, companies added to entity lists, visa restrictions, uh, etc. And I think that all of these will be reviewed. And as part of that policy, there will certainly be uh, a pathway forward on what the approach should be toward Chinese companies. Uh, but I would expect that where national security is involved, uh, that the Biden team will be cautious in permitting uh, the um, active involvement of uh, Chinese companies, for example, in our telecommunication systems or the purchase uh, of Chinese systems or products. Uh, so I think that there will be continued caution in that regard. I don't know where the new administration is going to go on this. I think their instincts are to remove restrictions and penalties that we've imposed on Chinese companies. But um, to a certain extent, they, they may not have very much room for maneuver because um, China will be driving the relationship, not Biden. Um, the Chinese are very arrogant these days, and they're going to push the new president in directions he doesn't want to go. So um, what he may be doing um, may not be what he wants, which is to have a deal on climate change or whatever. Um, China very well may force the issues in ways which will dismay the new president. I think the approach might be different, but the uh, desired goal is the same. You know, China has not been playing fair in the commercial and economic space, and they have leveraged some of their companies to take technologies to use for purposes that would harm U.S. national security. So this is something the United States absolutely has to keep an eye on. Unfortunately, President Trump's approach, which is sort of just poking China in the eye, trying to be confrontational, not leveraging other countries, makes it seem that there isn't a problem here. This is just a U.S. vendetta. Uh, and so it makes the U.S. approach seem less legitimate than it actually is. So I think Biden will try to broaden his approach and involve other countries and have more frank and direct discussions with the Chinese about how they use technology in ways that are harmful to other countries, to democracies, uh, and to our national security. I think coming into office, Biden will be under a lot of pressure to try to follow the same approach. I think it would be wise to step back and to establish a mechanism that will allow each of these uh, technical questions to be uh, managed by a commission, a committee, an, or, uh, an informal interagency group that uh, contains experts on these subjects beyond the kind of people who serve in government and superficially look at these issues. For example, you know, it, cutting off Huawei and ZTE may be less advantageous to us than co-opting Huawei and ZTE or Alibaba or others. Uh, we may want them to stay dependent on our technologies. With that, we want to also boost the support of our government and our market forces to develop and enhance the technologies that are coming out of the American uh, marketplace as well. But I think in some cases, we are better off by keeping in the tradition of the United States and the tradition of successful uh, modern economies keep our doors open to people, to ideas, to technologies. Um, now, some things are purely military or security uh, concerns, that, and that's where you need those experts in the room as well to say, okay, we're going to put a fence around these technologies. They're not going to be shared. But I think on the whole, the more integrated you are, the more you, you make the Chinese companies of concern dependent on their relationships with the outside world. We have strength here. This is not an area where we have to protect ourselves from a marauding beast and we can't fight back. We have the capacity to set the terms for these arrangements, and I think we ought to create a mechanism that allows each of them to be addressed in those terms.
I think it's a good sign that Catherine Tsai will be the next U.S. trade representative. But we've got to be concerned that her views are going to be overridden by others in the administration, including, of course, those of Biden himself. So this is certainly a work in progress. It's a good sign that uh, Biden is not going to take the Section 301 tariffs off immediately. But what he should be doing, because China has not been complying with its phase one trade deal, is increasing those tariffs, um, not thinking of taking them off. Well, on the on the question of the personnel, I think appointing Ms. Dai to uh, the U.S. Trade Representative's office is a returning to that office, someone who's quite uh, knowledgeable on litigation and skillful on the technical areas of competition with China and other countries uh, where we need to do a better job. What I haven't seen from her, and this is not a criticism, I just hope it will emerge in time that as the person to lead this, she'll have a very big picture of trade. The world is in a major period of flux. If the U.S. wants to lead again, it has the capacity to lead in re-examining, rebuilding the World Trade Organization to meet today's needs, not the needs of the 1990s. To look at doing uh, large-scale trade and investment agreements uh, across the board with our European and Asian partners and elsewhere in the world. Uh, we need strategic thinking. I would recommend that Ms. Dai spend some time with the former uh, USTR Robert Zellick, who is a a brilliant personality on the question of integrating global trade policy and regional trade policy with global and regional national security strategy. Uh, we need that today. Well, I think that Catherine Tai has a deep trade experience, especially with China. Uh, she is not as uh, prominent a figure as uh, Bob Lighthizer uh, has been in the Trump administration or maybe other prior USTRs. Uh, we don't know yet whether that signals uh, that uh, trade policy will be less important uh, in the administration. It's a question mark. Um, it may signal that, uh, that uh, President-elect Biden does not want to have a U.S. trade representative that has quite that much heft in the interagency as uh, Bob Lighthizer has had. But that's just, you know, it's speculation. We'll have to see. Um, we don't yet know what the trade agenda is going to be uh, for the Biden administration. And on the issue of of tariffs. I think that President-elect Biden has spoken about trying to build leverage, and tariffs can be used as leverage. If China wants to have them lifted, then they will have to make some uh, concessions. The uh, bipartisan support for Taiwan is unmistakable. Congress has uh, multiple times in the last few years demonstrated uh, that it wants to, on a bipartisan basis, maintain strong, substantive relations with the people of Taiwan. And I think that will not erode. I don't think, I think I've heard, I've heard some media accounts of people concerned that Biden will be less forthright with Taiwan. Well, there's a difference between helping Taiwan successfully sustain its autonomy and its vibrant democracy and keep it as part of a growing economic interaction in the global economic environment and promoting uh, showpiece official contacts, which raise the need on the Chinese side in their lights to put more pressure on Taiwan. When we do these things with Taiwan, it's very seldom the U.S. that pays the price for changing the arrangements that have allowed Taiwan to have this unprecedented period of autonomy and domestic success. Um, we, we could put that at risk uh, unnecessarily. So I hope that the Biden administration will move prudently to sustain those strong links, keep the doors open, communications between Taipei and Washington uh, as smooth as possible. At the same time, not taking unnecessarily uh, uh, disruptive steps that increase the chance that we will lose the peace and stability in the Western Pacific that has allowed Taiwan to prosper.
First, I would say that there's a lot of reason for the U.S. and Taiwan to have good relations. Um, we have an important economic relationship. Uh, we share democratic values. Um, and uh, every U.S. administration has had good relations with Taiwan. Every administration has sold weapons to Taiwan because it is a requirement under the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, but the real question is, will the policy change uh, at all? And I would say that uh, it, the Trump administration has done a lot of things very publicly and sometimes has tried to use Taiwan to sort of poke the poke the bear. Um, uh, and uh, and and uh, that has, I think, uh, created um, uh, more friction between the U.S. and China. So uh, what Biden does with Taiwan will depend in part on what China is doing towards Taiwan. Will it continue? to conduct uh, naval and air operations inside Taiwan's air defense identification zone and across the center line of the Taiwan Strait, uh, using not only military coercion, but diplomatic and economic coercion against Taiwan. If those uh, uh, policies continue, then I think the United States will have no choice uh, but to respond to them in order to ensure that deterrence holds uh, that China understands that the United States has a stake in Taiwan security and in cross-strait stability. But I do think that some of the sensitive things in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship uh, may be done in a way that's less, uh, less visible. I'm sure that Biden doesn't want to do that because he understands that would anger China. Um, but the important thing is for us to defend Taiwan. Um, for one thing, Taiwan occupies a strategic piece of real estate where the South China Sea and East China Sea meets. Um, Taiwan prevents the Chinese Navy and Air Force from surging into the Western Pacific. But there's something even more important, and that is China is attacking our democracy. It's attacking the whole notion of democracy. And we cannot afford to let China absorb any democracy, especially one as important as Taiwan. So we must stand with Taiwan. Whether Biden will do so or not, I don't know. But this is something that he must do. Well, I think we're going to see kind of a continuation of the status quo. A lot of people say President Trump was very different in his approach to Taiwan. But in the end, he maintained strategic ambiguity. You know, this question of what the United States would do in certain contingencies. Um, he continued arms sales to Taiwan. The difference is that President Trump, his policies were very unilateral. He tried to increase Taiwan's international space, for example, by sending more high-level representatives uh, to meet with Taiwan representatives. I don't think that's the direction Biden will go. And I actually think the direction Biden will go is more effective, which is to try to work again within international institutions. It's hard to increase Taiwan's international space if, like President Trump, you've pulled out of the very institutions Taiwan um, wants to be a part of. So I do think U.S. support for Taiwan will continue, uh, but that support will take a different form. During the campaign, um, Joe Biden said that he was going to be a human rights president when it came to China. So we've got to take him at his word. But let's remember what we're talking about. These are not some miscellaneous um, crimes. These are systematic, directed from the top of the Chinese political system. We're talking about mass detentions of at least a million people, maybe three million people. Um, China's implementing genocidal policies. It's institutionalized slavery and rape. There's probably forced organ harvesting from minorities. Um, these policies are horrific, and I believe that they require the United States and other countries to sever relations with China. They are that serious because we're talking about a situation that resembles that of the Third Reich in the late 1930s and even in the early 1940s. So um, my belief is that this has got to be a cutoff of relations. Uh, I'm sure Biden doesn't want to do that, not even contemplating that. But I hope that um, he gets to a better position on this. You know, in the 1950s, we worried about what was happening in Hungary. In the 1960s, what was happening in Czechoslovakia. And we took stands on those things that were rhetorical. But we really couldn't do much practically about them except keep our doors open to those people who can get away from those troubled places. 
with Hong Kong, we need to keep our doors open for those people from Xinjiang who can escape the, the dragnet that's been placed on them or Tibet or elsewhere in China. I hope we'll keep our doors open uh, for those exiles and refugees as well. But we have to be realistic about what we could do. And, and as, as in the case of technology and education and infrastructure, we got to get our own act correct. Now, the Biden administration is bringing in a lot of efforts to uh, promote women, to promote uh, diversity through Hispanics, Asians, and Blacks in the new administration. And those are important symbolically and substantively. We got to keep doing that. Uh, you know, the George Floyd incident really damaged the U.S. And what happened in the Congress this week really damaged the reputation for our institutional democracy. Uh, we shouldn't go throwing uh, epithets around about other people's activities until we do a better job of addressing our own uh, shortcomings. This is a very difficult um, question because the bottom line is that territorial integrity and sovereignty, as the Chinese Communist Party defines it, is their most important interest. And I don't think there's really anything the United States can do to convince them to allow you know, complete freedoms and protection of human rights in these areas. On the other hand, uh, we do shape Chinese behavior. I don't want to congratulate China for what they've done in Hong Kong, but it wasn't as bad as Tiananmen, right? So there has been improvements, and I think Xi Jinping probably didn't go in with full force because he was afraid of the international community response. And so again, it's not just the United States. If the United States criticizes China, China can say, oh, it's just the United States. We really need uh, coalitions. And instead of just trying to criticize China, I don't think shaming works. We should have a conversation about you know, how the United States and the Communist Party should want a better future for the Chinese people and, and how we could work together to help them improve in those areas. Well, I'd start by saying that the Trump administration was very slow to take actions uh, against uh, Xinjiang and the uh, and against uh, Beijing for its implementation of national security legislation in Hong Kong. Uh, on the Xinjiang issue, let's recall that in John Bolton's book, he relayed that uh, Trump told Xi Jinping that China's doing the right thing by locking up Uyghurs, essentially. Um, I think that Joe Biden genuinely cares about human rights. Um, and before the election, the Biden campaign actually stated that what is taking place in Xinjiang is a genocide, and that has gone further than the Trump administration has gone. Um, uh, I think that President-elect Biden has said he supports tough actions to punish China for its violations of uh, Hong Kong's autonomy. So yes, I expect that this uh, set of policies will continue and uh, the Biden administration will build on them. I would say that China is a uh, pragmatic country and they don't engage in issue linkage. So if there is any hope of making concessions to China to build goodwill, to cooperate in other areas such as transnational threats, disease, and then we think this will build goodwill that will then convince China to uh, make some concessions on issues that are important to us, like North Korea or South China Sea, that that's not gonna work and we're gonna end up disappointed. So we have to engage with China in a very direct, pragmatic way, understand that our interests conflict, but that we are not enemies. Um, I think, you know, the Chinese people, as far as I can tell from my time in China, like Americans, Americans like the Chinese people, this is not the Cold War. Um, we are just two countries that want different things uh, and we should compete and see, you know, who wins in that competition, but try to minimize the harm along the way. I hope that the Biden team comes into office with realistic perceptions of China. From what we've heard during the campaign and after the election, it sounds as if they have a view of China which doesn't correspond with reality. We must remember that China right now is extraordinarily aggressive, belligerent, and arrogant. So this is a moment that poses a grave danger, not just to the American people, 
but to peoples outside China everywhere. I think the most important uh, thing is to have a, a consistent uh, set of policies that comprise a strategy that can achieve reasonable objectives. Uh, simply having an attitude, which is uh, what the Trump administration sometimes uh, has had, is, is not good enough. I think we have to set priorities uh, and uh, we have to figure out what's, what's doable. Uh, there's a lot of areas that are going to need uh, attention. So uh, I think that the, 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 the president should, uh, should be personally involved in this policy more than President Trump uh, has been. But I suppose my uh, single uh, most important suggestion would be to not have a summit with Xi Jinping too early on. We have to get our own house in order. We have to strengthen the United States and we have to reinvigorate our alliances. We know that China takes advantage of countries when they see them as weak. And we know that China sees the pandemic as accelerating uh, the change in the pattern of the global balance of power, where China is emerging as a great power and they see the United States in decline. So I think that we should not engage in symmetry or serious negotiations with China until we have regained China's respect. Well, my, my suggestion uh, uniformly is America needs to restore self-confidence. A lot of what we're doing in Taiwan or elsewhere in the world is, is suggesting to our friends and, and partners that we're weak and scared. We don't need to be weak and scared. We have to be realistic. We're not the, the dominant power we were in the 1940s, nor as dominant as we were if, after the Cold War. Uh, there are other powers that we have to navigate around uh, and, to, and to find our way to cooperate where possible and, and to resist and counter uh, balance where necessary. Uh, we've got to be self-confident and restore that self-confidence, uh, reduce the hatred among tribes and peoples and factions in the U.S. and get a national purpose. You know, when Kennedy set the going to the moon in the 1960s as a national purpose. And uh, we've been wasting a lot of our time on purposes that are not shared in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. We've got to get back to uh, things the government can do. Infrastructure improvement would be a great place to start. Uh, bigger investments in science and technology, coordinating government support with private sector support for the most advanced parts of the economy. That can be accomplished through tax mechanisms and investment mechanisms that are within the capacity of the new administration to implement with Congress's support. So I think self-confidence would be my most important advice to the new administration. Biden在二零二零年竞选时，曾经把中国领导人习近平称作是恶棍，这或许为他今后的对华政策定下基调。但未来美中两国是继续沿着脱钩的路越走越远，还是能够实现双边关系的重置，我们仍需拭目以待。